very great welcome to you. Uh, it's a launch for the digital and social media marketing third edition. So we'll go through the intros to the editors. Uh, we will go to the panel members. Then Anna will introduce some of the key innovations. Then we have some short uh, videos and uh, introductions to other speakers. And hopefully we will pick up on some of the question and answers uh, in, in the uh, coming uh, session as well. So first of all, uh, the idea of the book was born nearly well shall we say 15 years ago uh, when we started teaching yeah. digital marketing so the idea was that we wanted to have something that's applicable to digital marketing and pick up on the uh, new trends and new activities new models and uh, hopefully we will be able to pick up on some of these models uh, later on today. So uh, I'm Alexei Heinz. Uh, I would like to introduce you to Alex Fenton and Anna Cruz, who are the co-editors, -edit as well as Gordon Fletcher, who I believe is not with us. And uh, I think uh, Alex wants to introduce us to our uh, speakers today. Alex, do you want to? Yeah, that's right, Alexei. So yeah, I'm, I'm Alex Fenton from uh, University of Chester, I'm Associate Dean of International and I'm one of the book editors. Um, so, Lexi, um, do you want me to just talk through our panellists uh, today and our presenters? Yeah, that would be great. Okay, great stuff. So, we've got Montserrat Canos. She's a seasoned global digital strategist and trainer, managing projects across various sectors in Spanish and English markets, excelling in managing projects across sectors and optimising outcomes. We're uh, honoured as well to have Simon Lesser, who's the co-founder and CEO of Dragon Metrics, uh, who was building software that helps customers get SEO data, they need to make smart decisions. And of course, we've got Professor Robert V. Kozinets, the multiple award winning professional researcher and teacher, and the inventor and founder of uh, Netnography, the multidisciplinary qualitative, qualitative digital research approach. We're honoured as well to have Tina Judic, who's chairman and co founder of the Tomorrow Group, <laughs> an independent agency network focused on performance, social, data science, and analytics, and shape. And she's going to be talking about shaping the future of digital experiences and every search. And we've also got um, in spirit um, our co-editor, uh, Gordon, and in spirit, Professor Jim uh, Lasinski is a cl clinical professor of marketing at Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management. But Alexi's um, joining kind of a bit more virtually today, I would say. Indeed. So he sent us uh, apologies because he can't be totally uh, with us in live, but he did present himself. So he's got a version of himself in a, a video recording, which we will enjoy <laughs> in a second as well. Thank you, Alex. Uh, great stuff. So uh, we wanted to highlight some of the differences or some of the key changes. And I believe uh, Anna wanted to make more well, highlights of these uh, for those of you who might be adopting this textbook in your reading. I would like to uh, give all of you a warm welcome to today's webinar and to the official launch of the digital and social media marketing and resource driven approach. So what is different from this book? A lot has changed since the second edition was launched. That was back in 2020. So uh, besides the latest developments in artificial intelligence, machine learning and automation, uh, what is really different, difficult, uh, sorry, what is quite different about this book is that sustainability is at the heart and the driving force of this book. So one of the aspects that we are introducing is the planet framework. Um, the advantage of this very practical framework is that it will help you prioritize your um, strategy and sus your sustainability uh, approach and align it to uh, your digital marketing strategy as well as the priorities of your stakeholders. One important principle in this uh, framework is the principle of transparency and non-deception. Another important aspect is the uh, importance of evaluating and learning from your approach as you progress. An important aspect that is an evolution in the book is also the expansion from the buyer persona. Uh, so in, in the next slide, what you will see is how we have evolved the concept from going beyond a purchase or beyond the concept of uh, buying into the important concept of stakeholders and that really goes beyond customers it takes into account how value is created and how value is delivered 
by uh, the organization to stakeholders. So it takes into account key stakeholders like your customers as well as your employees, your suppliers, your partners, and so on. So it's about value creation and certainly very much engagement and value delivery. Another important part is that this book takes into account a much wider context for applications. So it includes applications for for-profit organizations as well as business to business, as well as non-profit and the uh, third sector. So it's also relevant for uh, third sector charities, uh, donors, and NGOs as well. An important aspect here, what we are introducing as well, is the stakeholder value persona spring. So what that means is that the concept of the spring remains relevant. That is bringing your organization closer to your uh, persona through three key uh, important elements. So that's channels, content, and data. All the aspects relating to these three key pillars have been extensively updated, and particularly we're giving uh, a lot of importance to uh, data and particularly data-driven decision-making and evaluation. Therefore, we have more chapters that have been, uh, that are new chapters focusing on data and particularly data-driven insights. That includes qualitative data as well as quantitative data. So in terms of qualitative insights, we are introducing ethnography, and as it was previously said, we are incredibly fortunate that today we have the father of ethnography with us, and you will hear more about ethnography from Dr. Kosinex later on. Another important aspect of this book is the concept of the CMOD or the Zero Moment of Truth that was originally introduced by Jim Lesinski. So uh, you will hear more about uh, the Zero Moment of Truth, particularly how important it is in 2024 later on from Jim himself. So we're taking this concept and we are extending it further by taking into account the CMOD customer journey. And uh, as, as we all know, search is not linear. So what we are um, introducing in this, um, in this concept is the importance of a stakeholder centricity look. So it takes into account customer lifetime value and it takes it beyond. So it's not only acquisition, it's also about how you create and maximize customer lifetime value or donor time life value. Uh, taking into account the iteration, expansion, and recommendation of uh, your products or services or your offering. So another key aspect in the book, and as we all know, search is evolving. We have two chapters on SEO. One uh, is focusing on strategy. The other one is focusing on tactics. So you will hear a little bit more insight on these two key aspects from one of the co-authors of these uh, two chapters. That's uh, Montserrat Gano. You will hear more about uh, these insights from her later on. Taking into account the growth of influencer marketing and particularly the rise of the virtual influencer, we have a new chapter on influencer marketing that is going to help you make the most out of your influencer marketing strategies. One market that is growing considerably, and if you take into account the forecast for 2027, that suggests that B2B e-commerce is going to grow to around 20.9 trillion US dollars that really highlights the importance of understanding how organizations can market effectively through digital marketing to other organizations. Therefore, we have a new chapter on business to business digital marketing. Now, thinking about the exponential developments of AI, changes in legislation, the importance of data privacy, the importance of making sense of an increasing amount of data, what does the future look like? What does it mean for digital marketing? We have an extended and uh, quite interesting chapter on the future of digital marketing. So talking about the future of search, we're going to have Tina Jodic talking about that and more insights on what the future of search looks like. So uh, another key aspect is that Hi. the book is more international and has more aspects and more examples and case studies from a multitude of countries. So uh, without further ado, this is a very practical and hands-on book, and I would like to hand you over to the speakers who will elaborate on some of the points that I just mentioned. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Jim Lisinski, marketing professor at Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management and author of Winning the Zero Moment of Truth, known as ZMOT. Greetings from Chicago. 
I'd like to offer my personal warm, hearty congratulations to Alexi, Anna, Gordon, and Alex on the launch of their terrific new text, the third edition of Digital and Social Media Marketing, A Results-Driven Approach. And I'm thrilled that they've chosen to include ZMOT as a core concept in the textbook. The stakeholder infinity loop that they show here is a terrific application of my ZMOT concept. You know, ZMOT is more relevant today than ever, more relevant even than it was a decade ago when we first wrote about it. If you think about the elements, stimulus, zero moment, first moment, and second moment, looping back around to stimulus, boy, here we are in 2024 with all kinds of zero moments. When we wrote the book, we just imagined it mostly around search and a little bit around the early days of social. But if you think about it now, whenever a consumer gets the idea that they might need a new product, brand, or service in a category, whether that's an external stimulus or an internal stimulus, say, oh, I end up with a flat tire on my car, and now I need a brand of new car tires, or I see an ad for Michelin tires, and that makes me think, hmm, maybe it's time for new tires. From there, of course, even today, we don't just show up at the local garage or tire shop and say, what kind of tires do you have? Yes, we would, of course, go on uh, Facebook or Instagram. We'd ask our friends. We'd go into a subreddit. We'd do Google searches. We'd use AI, uh, generative search engines, uh, like Anthropic or Gemini or ChatGPT, to type in best car tires for my sedan or for my needs or for my model. And we get all kinds of information prior to showing up at that first moment of truth at the garage or or uh, car repair shop. And because it's happening prior to the first moment, we call that the zero moment of truth. And there's an explosion of zero moments as now, of course, we're living our lives more and more online. And so it's great to see um, that Alexi, Anna, Gordon, and Alex have included this concept as a fundamental and elemental one in the text because it continues to be something that marketers need to understand and master what that zero moment of truth is, and importantly, how to win all of the key zero moments of truth for your brand. Because as consumers change their path to purchase the information, the tools, the technologies that they use to make their decisions, it's all the more important for us as marketers to understand what they're doing, how they're making these decisions, and adapt and change our marketing to them in order to win those key zero moments of truth. So again, congratulations on the launch of this new textbook. Uh, it's a really exciting addition and uh, proud to have my zero moment of truth concept be a part of it. Thanks again. Thank you, but uh, we appreciate uh, his time for taking and recording this for us. So Alex, uh, over to you. So yeah, that was fascinating insights from Jim, and um, uh, it's really interesting to see, isn't it, how how things are evolving now? Um, you know, with more AI and search uh, results and so forth as well. I think um, it's um, you know been the kind of the the death of some websites and content producers, and the uh, the the bonus of others. Like Jim mentioned, Reddit there as well, which is um, it's quite interesting to see search behaviours now with. Um, people searching and adding the word Reddit at the end so that they can get human opinions and so forth as well. So we've got one of our um, doctorate students studying netnography and Reddit at the moment, and it seems like a good time to be doing that as we're trying to get human voices coming through in some of the AI. And I think that leads us very nicely into um, the next um, talk with Montserrat, obviously talking about SEO in AI. So I'm looking forward to, to this one. Thank you so much for attending the launch of this world of the and for having me here and attending this presentation. During the next 10 minutes or so, I will be um, giving you I mean, some insights and some ideas as to how to use SEO and mark, uh, oh, sorry, AI for SEO and marketing growth, basically expanding a little bit on what we are talking in the book, but also in relation, in, in the context of this uh, big industrial revolution that we are living at this moment in time, which is, which is seeing um, as human beings, whenever a piece of technology comes along, I'm always reminded of the so-called Amara's Law, where we tend to overestimate and underestimate um, at different stages that uh, piece of technology. Remember the dot-com bubble burst a long time ago? 
that basically overinvest banks in the internet when it finally became mainstream. But first of all, I would like to ask you, how do you feel about AI right now? Because with the whole concept of artificial intelligence becoming um, uh, becoming mainstream uh, very recently, some uncertainty has come along as well, which is a mixture of positive feelings and negative feelings. Positive feelings that even encourage us to research and use the tools to our own advantage, and negative feelings possibly stemming from encountering this. Um, but also those very like catching um, headlines talking about the lack of job security and, of course, the sustainability concerns um, implied. Um, and at this point, I'd really like to point out that I am talking about artificial intelligence tools because, as the wonderful um, Brittany Miller has recently pointed out in the webinar, uh, we tend to use AI and AI tools interchangeably. Um, in terms of AI tools, maybe Jackie Fan's hype cycle might help us explain the, uh, um, the adoption um, uh, journey, so to speak, of every single piece of technology, uh, including ChatGPT. So basically, it um, describes the peaks and troughs of every piece of technology for um, up to a certain moment in time. But what it is very clear is that despite all of these headlines about um, a winter in AI investment, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it seems like the concept is here to stay. Um, so, why not? So, what can brands do in this context? Well, keep your website optimized and keep your strategy adapted to every single market that you operate in and to every single target audience. Some use cases for SEO and digital marketing growth that I have found particularly useful are market research and competitor research. And with these tools, you can basically summarize the key points of very long research pieces, say the, those ones published by the European Union, for example. You can, um, um, you can have um, you know, uh, personalization, you can make personalization by analyzing different segments, customer segments, or even customer arms with content patterns across niche or across a different market. And you can even use it for technical SEO, for example, is markup. And this is an example of that, yeah. And yes, AI tools are not there, and they are not workers. They are not there to give you an answer to absolutely everything. They are there to give you a lead so you can follow through it, yeah. Um, another thing to bear in mind is built. Notice most of the training models have been developed in the US, yeah. Uh, with one notable exception, which is Mistral, uh, which was developed in France, and I would very much encourage you to, to take a look at it. Right. And also around bias, confirmation bias, when we do research and uh, we have an idea, we might as well research to confirm those beliefs. So, one thing that we can do about it is ask the tools to give us different perspectives, because a human overview is necessary. But then we can have different perspectives um, all in one place. Um, to implement all this, and learning culture is necessary. Um, testing is absolutely, absolutely necessary. So what we read, what we hear at conferences, then we may be falling behind. But we need to use it with some critical thinking as well. So in the same way that we um, think about our own resources and our own need, needs when we um, um, keep always a strategic long-term approach. Don't keep researching because otherwise it, you, you may fall behind yeah, as companies and as professionals as well. So there's really, okay. really interesting thoughts there. And you mentioned about the, you know, um, thinking about different parts of the world as well, which, um, you know, we quite often in the West, we think about, you know, Google as being synonymous with search. But I think... Um, you know, within this session, within this book, you know, we've, we've really, over the third edition, really tried to broaden out and look at the global context of all these things. And certainly Alexi and I and, and some of the other editors have had the opportunity to work in other parts of the world, including China, where things are quite radically different. Um, so that, I think that leads us quite neatly on to um, introducing Simon, who's obviously the co-founder of 
and SEO Dragon metrics as well. It's great SEO loves building software that helps customers get the SEO data, but even better, it's allowing us to, to you know, utilize data sets and, and utilize these tools and softwares across the world. So I'm really looking forward to uh, to hearing what Simon's got to say about these um, tools tools for um, AI as well and, and Dragon metrics. All right, thank you, and good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully, you all can see my screen. If not, uh, scream at me. Otherwise, I'm going to continue as, as if you can. So my name is Simon Letcher, and I'm co-founder and CEO of Dragon Metrics. Dragon Metrics is an all-in-one SEO software platform. So that means can all the tools you would need uh, to do SEO, it's all in the platform rankings, keyword research, competitors, whatever. OK, so for the last 13 years, I've been building SEO tools. And so today I want to talk about, you know, AI tools for, for SEO, how people are using them right now, how people should be using them, um, because those are different topics, unfortunately. And then some advice for how, how you can uh, move forward and use them to your uh, best abilities here. Um, so let's move on. So uh, when I say uh, AI tools for SEO, most people instinctively think, content tools. Uh, there's certainly more usage, and we're going to look at that in a second, but it's just kind of embedded in people's minds that uh, this is the this is the use case, right? As soon as ChatGPT hit the scene, um, all SEOs and website owners were like, okay, we're going to use this to, to start creating content. And it makes sense because, you know, <laughs> a hat or content is a really time-consuming and important uh, thing uh, that, that that everybody needs needs to do to be successful for organic search, and so as a result, the market has absolutely responded. Um, and there's over 600 tools by by G2, uh, you know, the, the the software review site has 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 found, and uh, so there's a lot of them out there. There's a lot of people using them, and um, so you know the, the the issue here, and what I'm going to talk about is we should always remember that a tool, it's a great word when talking about software or real world stuff, because tools can either help you, like cut a block of wood, or it can hurt you and cut off a finger or an arm or something like that. And so that's really important to, to keep in mind. You know, when these tools came out, everybody had in their mind, they said, oh, this is great. I'm going to use AI to create, you know, hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of pages for me, and just the traffic is going to roll in. And certainly last year, we have an example of somebody who did just that thing. Um, they uh, scooped a competitor's content, the entire site, and ran it through an LLM and rewrote all that content and put it on a client site. And it worked. They got 3.6 million uh, visits for doing this. It's a huge win. That's what everybody should do. And great. Uh, the reality is very quickly after he posted that, uh, people kind of did some reverse engineering, found out which site it was because he was trying to be discreet about it. And his content went absolutely to zero. Because when you look at the content, it was complete garbage. And that's what these SEO tools can do if you're not careful and if you don't have human intervention. Um, and uh, so... You know, it, it, it's that's that's not exactly what we should be doing. But does that mean that we can't use AI tools to help write content at all? And the, the answer to that is no. It doesn't mean that. And in fact, Google has taken this issue head on 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 their, their their blog. They they have an article about how to do it. And kind of summarizing their position is is they say you know it doesn't matter how you create content using AI, using um, you know human writers, using a team of monkeys with typewriters, whatever. However you create it, it still needs to be uh, original, high-quality, people-first content to uh, uh, demonstrate qualities of, you know, EEAP, you know, uh, uh, expertise, uh, authority, you know, all, all, all those things. And that's really what's the most important thing. I uh, said, in my way, uh, in, in my opinion, I would say, like, why should I bother to read something that you didn't even bother to write? You know, for me personally, I've, I've I've grown up with the web and I love it. And I think it's a wonderful place. And I don't take kindly to people just essentially defacing it and, and putting garbage out there. I think that there is even an ethical or moral stance that we should be taking about just putting garbage content out there. And so the way that we do that is we can use these amazing LLM tools, but it needs to go through the same editorial process. 
that you would use with a human writer. You know, you wouldn't just uh, hire a content writer and then say, okay, go ahead. Um, whatever you write, just post it directly to to our site. Oh, I, I, at least I hope you wouldn't. You would send that through an editorial review. And that's what needs to happen for AI tools as well. Um, I would say even more so strictly than what you would uh, let loose a, a, a human to do as well. So there's plenty of content tools that you can use, although I would say you don't want to have it write the entire article for you. But there's great things of fine tuning and idea generation. And certainly there are plenty of tools that can do that as well. Again, you can cut a block of wood or you can chop off your finger. And so rephrasing, summarizing, changing the tone, simplifying, expanding, or just asking it to come up with a couple ideas here and there, and then the editor kind of refines those. Those are great uses of AI tools here. Okay, so then is it ever appropriate to do the scale thing, to you know have it write a thousand, hundred thousand pages of content on your site? And the surprise, my surprising answer there is that, yes, it can be a good idea to do that. You just need to ask yourself, is this for humans or is this for search engines? And what I mean by that is, for example, most recently I recommended there's a government organization that has huge amounts of data and data sets. And in all these data sets, they cannot possibly have a human write prose to explain and analyze this data. However, that would be very useful to somebody. So to humans, when I, when I say somebody, I mean humans. So uh, you know, it's a great idea, that's a great use case to run that data that's just raw numbers and data tables and charts and stuff, run them through an LLM and have it generate a, a, an article explaining why that why that's useful, what it means, and things like that. So it can you can even use that scale, but it must be written for, for humans. Now, another way that people are using AI uh, tools for, for SEO is keyword research. And again, you can help yourself or you can hurt yourself out. Uh, or, or you can hurt yourself. So, um, for example, if somebody says, generate a list of keyword ideas for me, people are doing this all the time. And they say, give me search engines too, or search volumes, meaning how many people are searching for these keywords. And that's almost, almost right. The problem is that uh, LLMs are really confident about their data and they just make stuff up. They do not have the same kind of data that an SEO tool like Dragon Metrics or any other SEO tool out there. But they are fine to completely make something up. If you ask them for search volumes, here you go, here are search volumes. A great example of that is I did this and I said, give me search volumes and the hot dog hypotenuse ratio for every one of my keywords. And didn't skip a beat. Here's the search volume. Here's the hot dog hypotenuse ratio, even though I obviously made up that metric. So you have to be careful when you use these tools. And in my opinion, there are even better ways to use AI for SEO, uh, AI tools for SEO, not just content or keyword research. For example, internal link suggestions is a great way. If you can feed your whole site through LLMs and have them understand the context of what you're writing in a content writing tool. Select that paragraph and say, hey, I want to you know, link to another page on my site. What would be a good page to link? And AI is great at saying, this page has relevant content that you should be linking to, to this paragraph or this sentence right there. Conductor has this tool in alpha. There's other plenty of tools out there. So I'm trying to be, uh, you know, mention a bunch of different tools out there and not just Dragon Metrics, of course. So uh, with keyword research, uh, you can do the same uh, as we showed before, but just don't ask it things that it doesn't know. It's great at suggesting topics and ideas and concepts. That's perfect, but don't ask it for keyword difficulty. Don't ask it for search volumes or hot dog hypotenuse ratios either. Um, now, most keyword research tools uh, out there um, can identify search intent. You know, what is the searcher looking for when they're looking for this keyword? But most of the time, it's kind of simplistic. Is it informational? Is it transactional? Is it navigational? You know, is it brand? That kind of thing. Um, Ahrefs has a really cool tool where they'll actually look at, they take the, all the content on the SERP and they run it through an LLM. And they have an LLM do what one of the things it does best, which is summarizing content. And it can summarize the kind of things that are appearing on the SERP and describe what the searcher is most likely looking for. And so that's a great use of it. 
And besides that, the sky is just the limit. You know, it's great for extracting embeddings, extracting entities, um, generated alt text for images, um, analyzing the, the intent of a page, the language of a page, the sentiment of a page. These are all great things. Now, my favorite way of integrating kind of all those things is Screaming Frog. And actually, as it's following your page, you can take that content, feed it directly to an LLM, and they even have some, some uh, prompts there for you too, and do that analysis, bring it back directly in your SEO tool and streamline the whole the whole process. That way you don't have to build your own kind of custom thing. You can just write your prompt and then integrate it directly with Screaming Frog. And there's other tools that can do that too, but this is one of the most, most common ways. So there's plenty of great ways to use AI in your SEO tool. I'd love to see more innovation come from SEO tool providers and not just using content. And for, for everyone else who's using these tools to make sure that you're using them in the best way. So thanks everybody. Perfect timing. Thank, perfect timing that. Thanks, Simon. Um, put your LinkedIn profile um, in the chat as well. Uh, but again, really nice thinking about Montserrat's kind of strategic approach and then some really practical, interesting insights there from Simon. So thank you so much for that. So the next session, um, just over 10 years ago, I, I was starting my PhD looking at social media marketing and uh, our co to Gordon mentioned, he's an anthropologist, he mentioned the word netnography to me. And I started Googling that, and it's kind of one of those sliding door moments. And then a little later, um, Alexei um, asked me if I wanted to get involved with the first edition of the digital marketing book. And I uh, wrote a chapter on social media and uh, mentioned ethnography. And, of course, over, over the last 10 years, um, social media has grown hugely and has uh, ethnography has as well. So it's a great honor to um, introduce um, Professor uh, Robert Kozinex, who's the founder of, of ethnography. And I think... Um, the book uh, has developed, I think, in its third edition to embrace this even further. So it's fantastic that Rob's here to talk um, talk us through um, netnographic data insights. So um, over to you, Rob. Look, thank you guys for including some sections on netnography and for doing such an interesting webinar here. I'm learning. I'm sitting back, <laughs> relaxing, and learning a lot about uh, AI. And I love the uh, the critical yet uh, yet uh, really expert approach that uh, both of the speakers have given us. Super useful stuff. Thank you. So, uh, what, what would you think? Obviously, today we talk to students, and uh, as part of our audiences, it's quite a lot of textbook uh, applications for other professors. Mm -hmm. How would you recommend that other professors were integrating ethnography uh, to their teaching, uh, yeah. digital marketing insights? In some ways, uh, summary of what you experienced today. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think um, people started writing about ethnography as a marketing research method shortly after I had introduced the method in the late 1990s. So I think Mike Solomon was probably one of the first ones in the consumer behavior textbook to include a section on ethnography. And then it's, it's pretty much in most consumer behavior texts and marketing research texts. And I think people found very early on, even before there was social media as we know it, right. uh, that there were these online groups that I was already studying way back in the ancient days of news groups and news nets, uh, people were already seeing, oh, we can find people talking about wine. We can find people talking about baby strollers. We can find people talking about shopping malls or movies or entertainment. Uh, and so they were giving students assignments. Hmm. They were giving them assignments where they could go online, hear public conversation, and then what do you do? How do you, how do you make that in interesting? How do you follow that in a rigorous way where there are rules? Uh, how do you collect that data? Uh, what else can you add to that data? What kind of uses can we give to that data in order to find insights for marketers? Mm -hmm. So some of the very early stuff that I wrote was about using this online social media data, before it was called social media, to find insights to help marketers to understand pain points, to come up with new product innovations, uh, to develop uh, new messaging, uh, to look at the effects of existing messaging, uh, to think about what uh, public opinion is uh, on particular topics as it's expressed uh, on these different platforms and sites. And now, of course, as we get more digital marketing, as we get more 
communication out there in various platforms and various sections of various platforms, Reddit, subreddits, sub subreddits, you know, sections of particular uh, areas, we find that there are not only conversations that are happening, but but conversations that we as marketers and as marketing researchers can become mm. a part of. Mm. And so it's not just listening and then saying, okay, here's uh, some insights from that, although that's still very much a valid use. It's also listening and saying, okay, here's where the influencers are. Here's where the interesting conversations are. Uh, here's where the platforms are. Maybe we can become a part of this conversation as well. Maybe we can join in with this. Mm. So, you know, um, the last speaker was absolutely right that we should think about these things uh, uh, like AI and SEO as tools. And that nonography is no different. Mm. It's a tool. And like a hammer or like a chainsaw or whatever we've got, uh, it's not good at everything, right? It's good at some things. It's it's very good, I think, at uh, uh, early stage discovery. Mm -hmm. um, but you may need to go and validate what you have with wider markets if that's your goal. Mm. So I was speaking in your class today, and I gave the example of a group called Hive, which is out of Munich, which is a company that uh, for a while was running maybe one to 200 netnographies a year for different corporate clients using the netnography uh, methodology to figure out how uh, Beierstorf, which owns Nivea, could come up with uh, a new deodorant that was positioned uniquely in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And they found from the data that a lot of the discussion online around deodorants was actually linked to things like laundry and stain removal mm -hmm. and sweat stains and all these things that are quite you know, unpleasant but very much a real part of life. Yeah. And so they were thinking, and this is 2008 when this was happening, they're thinking, should we follow this as an opportunity? Because it's so linked online to in these conversations. And, uh, you know, they had internal discussions and they decided, yes, let's do it. And they got their chemical engineers, who are great at Beierstorf, uh, to, to develop a product and launched it as uh, Nivea Invisible for Black and White for stains on black, you know, white chalky stains on black and yellow yucky stains on white. And it was good for both. Even though the engineers had resisted in very engineering culture, they pushed back and said, it's not really our fault. This is this is about the chemicals and about, you know, whether you had garlic to eat, uh, what's in, you know, whether you have a good natural fabric or not. But the fact was that these guys could solve the problem. It took them a little while. They did. And it was the most successful launch in Nivea's history. And this came straight out of the netnographic data and the netnographic analysis, I should say, the online data, the social media data, and the netnography method that helped to bring those insights to their attention and they could innovate from there based on a real pain point. So I think that's it's an interesting use case around innovation, yes. but there are many, many other, you can think about, so I recently did some work with uh, Whedon and Kennedy, the advertising agency. Those guys wanted to know uh, for, uh, a couple of big brands in automotive uh, and in, and in uh, food and beverage, what the brand image was and how, uh, you know, Generation Z saw their older brands. Mm -hmm. And then one of them was about how a black American consumers saw their brands. So a lot of the data we collected was around Instagram. Mm -hmm. It was around TikTok, particularly Gen Z is really out there in TikTok. You can watch these videos. You know, we had it. We had a team that I trained mm -hmm. at Whedon and Kennedy looking at these TikTok videos and saying, okay, how, what is the brand associated with? What is it linked with? What's the context of using that brand? Mm -hmm. Who was posting? How are they posting? You know, what are the messages? What are the profiles? And we dug deep into it and we came up with a pretty sophisticated brand analysis that Whedon later used for rebranding and repositioning those particular brands. So that was another way that you can use this beyond sort of coming up with a pain point needs. You can look at the brand meaning. You mm -hmm. can look at product category meaning. Yeah. Um, you can look at who the influencers are, what their content is, what the response around it is, and get a sense of how to use the, the influencers. So really, it's a tool, but you you can find so many different uses for a tool. Mm. A tool can be useful for hammering uh, a nail in the wall, but it can also be useful as a weapon, and it could also be useful for taking things out of the wall or prying open a lid for uh, you know for a jar you're trying to open. So I mean, ethnography is like that. It it can't necessarily be you know useful for uh, you know uh, I don't know feeding a child maybe, but <laughs> there's some things that you don't use it for, and there are other things that you would use it for, uh, and I think there's just a lot of process of discovery there.
brilliant. But if you were to think about Simon, obviously his tool is focusing on data, so which is looking at hard data, as we want to say, so statistics. Mm -hmm. And so if you, I know you've uh, clarified the difference between qualitative and quantitative data, and um, you know, in terms of decision making, where would you see it first? Would you consider to go down the keyword research first, and then uh, ethnography, or would you say it's ethnography more the at the more ideas identification stage. Yeah, I mean, I think it all depends on what your question is and what you're trying to answer, right? There's no one size fits all mm -hmm. method. And ethnography is, is a fairly flexible method in terms of okay. how you set things up, but it's all driven from question. Right. So, you know, if, if you are trying to, if your question is around quantifying the market potential of something or other, you'll obviously need to move to things like surveys and mm. quantifying things. But if you're looking for insight into the kinds of discourses people are having on a particular form, you really want to read through that. I mean, my sense for, for qualitative research in general in marketing is that, you know, managers kind of live in a world where they don't necessarily mm -hmm. have daily contact with their customers. It's changing a little bit because of social media, but not nearly as much as I thought it was. It's basically you're involved internally, you're producing something, and then you kind of throw it over a wall, and then you watch and see what the results are coming back. Yeah. But netnography really kind of allows you to bring people's use of that product, their unboxing of the product, their shopping for the product, their their lived experience of that product, you know, mm -hmm. back into a company. And I think that's the most useful part of this kind of research is it, it mm -hmm. is it humanizes the humans who actually make business run. Yes. Right? We're really in a world where we're so distanced. We we see people as, you know, textual forms or mm. content or AI that gets, you know, uh, dis more and more distance from that human experience. Mm. And I think netnography uh, done well, it involves the researcher. And in, in many cases, that researcher could be the person who's the marketer or the business person mm -hmm. in the research itself, which means in contact with those people who actually are the ones who are ultimately paying your salary mm. and making your company run. Uh, right. And so, you know, bringing that into managers has been something I've been doing since I started teaching it uh, at gym school at Kellogg. And, you know, 1998, I started teaching netnography to my students. Mm -hmm. And I still hear from those students back that, you know, they've brought that into companies and brought that voice of the consumer in into their meetings, into their daily lives. So teaching business students netnography in these little assignments can pay big dividends later on. And now we have so many different places mm. that we can collect that data from, so many different platforms, so many different kinds of voices that are out there. And uh, for a business professional who wants to learn about netnography, are there any events that you would recommend to attend? <laughs> oh, well, well, that's a leading question. Well, we are going to have NetnoCon here in Marseille. At, um, uh, May the 28th to the 30th <laughs> okay. of 2025. And I think it's yeah. going to be a great event. And we certainly uh, welcome that participation. But there's plenty of, of yeah. online resources for people too through the Association okay. for Netnographic Research, which is netnographic research with, the, with P-H-I-C dot org, O-R-G. So we have yeah. lots of facility. All great. That is still free membership. That's we have great. tons of resources. We have the proceedings from the from the prior ones. And of course, the textbook is a great introduction to the <laughs> yeah. method, one that you really would want to familiarize yourself yeah. with first. And if you uh, decide that this is something useful, right? Look, we've had we've had focus groups for many years. Yeah. Ethnographic work is still in enormously valuable, but it's time intensive and expensive. Mm. Ethnography is something that you can you can teach in, in you know a, a, a couple of days. You can learn, you can practice, you can mm. refine. The, the craft of that. There's so much interesting stuff. You just want to be rigorous about how you get those insights. You want to try and do it ethically, and you want to try and do it rigorously and bring that into action. And I think, uh, you know, the description that you guys give in the in the book is a wonderful introduction to doing that process. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, uh, Robert. So I think the key point is obviously the reason we the book is on digital marketing. It does have a lot of different tentacles, but uh, sure it uh, it's it's a very interesting and deep method that you can apply in what we've tried to do today with students in one hour. But it didn't quite go to that uh, same. So it does take a bit of time to get used to. But uh, obviously, the more you practice, the, the better you get at it. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, over to you, Alex. Thank you so much, um, Alexei and, and Rob, for that. I mean, netnography has been a game changer for us, hasn't it? And um, and it's a big influence on the book, as you say, in terms of understanding those audiences and the stakeholder value personas and the pain points and trust points and so forth. Um, it's been huge for us. Uh, but equal, equally influential in this new third edition book, um, 
We've got um, Tina, who's the chairman and co-founder of the Tomorrow Group, uh, you know, the independent agency network focused on performance, social data science analytics and shaping the future of our digital experiences. But quite a few colleagues from these different aspects of Tomorrow Group have um, fed into the book as well, including, um, you know, this wrote to think about the influencers chapter. So um, Rob and his colleagues wrote a great recent book on influencers and then been working with industry and with Tomorrow Group and other practitioners. Practitioners. So the book's been a real um, iteration, I think, between, you know, academia and industry in the sort of same way that, that netnography is, um, works uh, has had a big influence on both as well. Um, so that's perfect timing to bring Tina in now and talk to us about uh, bringing this together with the shaping the future of digital experiences. So over to you, Tina, if we can. Hello, everybody. Well, this is a delight hey, to be the last speaker of the day. They were That was fabulous. Um, what a delight to be part of this. And congratulations on the book. Everybody has mentioned that. So I obviously should extend my congratulations for the third edition of it. Truly, truly excellent. So um, search. It's come a long way, but um, today it, we believe it's undergoing something of a revolution. I've got about 10 minutes or so, and I was going to explain a little bit about what found my digital marketing agency is doing about it. Um, we used to think of search as something confined to, to Google, to Bing, to Yahoo back in the day, but it's now evolved into an integral part of our online experiences. Here's um, a little video. Are you ready for a new beginning? This is how we really feel. Search has come about over the last few years. It's changed so considerably and I've never been more excited um, in my life. The landscape has truly evolved. Even if we just look at um, a few stats here, I could, I could mention many, but let's go with these. 40% of Gen Z initiate searches on social media. That's largely on Instagram and on, on TikTok. 40%, it's pretty sizable. Um, 68% of online experiences originate from search engines. Yeah, well, that seems pretty high, but it's dropped considerably. This is not the case anymore. We're all living lives within social. And as a result, we're starting to instigate um, more activity within social. And then one was, which was really interesting for me was, again, coming back to Gen Z, 62% of Gen Z prefer TikTok over Google for local business searches. Um, I kind of like a bit of TikTok. I'm probably maybe out of the target age range for it. But if I'm looking for new restaurants now, and I'm not necessarily going onto Google to see how well um, it's performing ratings, I'm going onto TikTok to see what someone's live experience is with it. And I can only see that evolving. So what does that mean? Um, with Gen Z leading the way on TikTok, we're seeing an evolution in the way people, they're not just not just how they're searching across platforms, but how they're searching across generations. And what we're seeing is that search is now very much inspiration led. So for consumers, what do we mean by that? They're actually looking to be inspired. Sometimes they're not looking at all. They're just within a platform, engaging within a platform, and boom, something spikes their interest because they're inspired within the within the realm of the content that they're absorbing. They're also really looking for authenticity as well um, in terms of what's real. If they're searching for brands, does that brand connect with me? Is that right for me? And then validation as well. And I know a, a couple of the talks we touched on and within the book as well, influencer is becoming a much bigger part of digital marketing. And it's a really true space. We've all been influenced um, over the years, right? We're all we're always influenced by all things around us, but actual creators, influencers are having a major impact on what we're doing. So what does that mean for brands? So brands have to focus on a number of things. Capturing visibility, how do I do that? What's the best way to do that? How do I make sure I'm capturing the visibility of the audiences that I want to capture? And then how do I um, command attention? It's a huge space. There is so much noise going on. How do I stand out from the crowd? 
And then on top of that, brands have got huge goals and not always huge budgets to go with it. So how do they maximize their performance? And how do they do that across every searchable platform? And that's how we talk about it now. It's not just search engines, it's searchable platforms. So all marketers need to be thinking differently about what they're doing and what their approach is to search. So, <clears throat> the concept of a linear purchase journey, pur purchase journey it's, it's somewhat outdated. We've, we've just talked about that a little bit with the zero, zero moment of truth. Um, many of you will be aware of the, the purchase funnel. It was a traditional concept of a marketing funnel, and it's still really helpful for categorizing um, marketing mix. I would never want to say, let's not look at this at all, but it's being really mindful that it doesn't really reflect how audiences um, are engaging with brands online. Um, gone are the, are the days of the straight path to purchase as it's visualized here. We're seeing that customers are moving backwards and forwards. They're evaluating and they're exploring. They're looking for more multiple touch points to make an informed decision about something. So there was obviously research and something released by Google over 20 years ago with regards to ZMOD. However, um, some more recent research that was led by Google that evaluated hundreds of different purchase journeys across 31 categories, um, they analyzed a number of different touch points that were observed. And they saw, as just mentioned, that people are continuously navigating backwards and forwards as they search on different platforms and websites, and they're gathering as much inspiration and information as they possibly can. Google in 2020, they called this the messy middle. And this is where today's consumers are living. They're constantly exploring. They're constantly looking for different options. They're constantly having different triggers as opposed to, oh, that looks like it might be nice. Might I be interested in that? Yes, I might be. I'll explore some more information on that. Boom, I'll purchase. No, we're jumping here, there and everywhere, which is fascinating, but it's really hard for marketers to truly understand. How do I deal with that? How do I speak and capture those consumers at the right moment? Um, I'm just going to play a little video that FAM put together. We developed something called the Every Search Framework, and it was to help brands really navigate this new world. It's recognizing that search, it's, it's no longer linear, as we said, and it's no longer confined to traditional um, search engines. So we wanted to really help them understand what we could do to help them. Everything you knew about search has changed. It is no longer just about search engines. Search is also social platforms, marketplaces, travel portals, video sharing and entertainment platforms. Search is everywhere. Found brings calm to the digital chaos. Through our Every Search framework, we map where your customers are, assess your current position and determine where you need to be. So you can seize opportunities to reach customers on all relevant platforms with campaigns precisely tailored for impact, ensuring standout visibility and unparalleled digital success. Embrace the search revolution today with every search. That wasn't ever supposed to be my voice, I should say. I was helping the team pull this together, as you do. And uh, I said, look, I'll just record this for you. And you, that will help with the with the video creation. And lo and behold, um, I'm still there. So uh, apologies that you were still listening to my voice then. So how we now view consumers. We've talked a bit about the funnel. As I say, we don't want to say the funnel doesn't exist. We just want to acknowledge that it can't always help everything that we're trying to do. Certainly for us when we're working with clients to, tr to truly understand how they can reach consumers, search, certainly within the realm of search. Now, I've jumped straight to the messy middle here. I would hate to say the ZMOT doesn't exist. Of course, it doesn't. Actually, both of them work quite nicely hand in hand. When I look at ZMOD, I see it as very much a B2B focus for us when there is a huge amount of consideration that needs to go into a purchase decision. But we have very much focus a lot of our energy on the messy middle. And then taking it a step further with found, it's then starting to map the audience insights that we get access to. So who, are the, who is the audience? Where are they? Where are they engaging? Where are you as a brand featuring? What is the opportunity for you to reach optimal coverage for your brand? And then once we understand how consumers search, 
then we can actually determine how to reach them. I mean, these are just examples. These are all searchable platforms, Google, Alexa, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. We've got um, text-based search. We've got voice-based search. We've got image-based search. We've got video-based search. There is so much that we need to consume and we're able to consume now. It's a really noisy space for anybody to be operating in. So, I said it's a revolution. It has changed a lot. Why has this happened now? It's two things. One, consumer demand. There's an absolute need for this. But two, it's technology advancement has enabled this as well. And a few things that we've seen happen. Social search, as we've said, is on the rise. Platforms like TikTok, they're becoming that go-to tool for Gen Z. And they're shifting away from the search engines. We always thought Google would be dominant. They're struggling. They're looking to see how can we respond to this? What is the best way that we can do to ensure that search is not taken away from us? A decline in search quality. Search engine results, they are frustrating users. Yes, we're seeing some better experiences, and we've obviously seen that with, with Google as well. But even still, it's very different to the experiences we're used to seeing within the social platforms that we're engaging with. AI-driven competitors, we've talked about it a lot today. I mean, who here is not using ChatGPT, Gemini, Claude? It was something a few years ago we just weren't necessarily engaged in as the common user. But now we're attracted to it. We're utilizing it. And as a result, we want more conversational and more concise search experiences. And then just the general diversification of search, we're seeing a growth in voice search, in visual search, in social search, and it's reducing that reliance on the traditional text-based, keyword-based searches. So what's next? I'm sure there's a ton of things that many of you would say are coming up. Here's just a few things that I've come up with. Um, VR-friendly sites, those that are optimized for virtual reality experiences. We've seen a lot of the big online companies really wanting to push this forward. And I don't see for one minute why this won't come, uh, come to the fore over the next few years. Infinite scroll. This seems like a crazy one. But when I look at Google now, even now I have to press on my phone to look for more results. We want to have more fluidity. And my advice to Google would be give me more fluidity by being able to scroll through and then swipe very, you know, swipe seamlessly for the results that I want to take a look at because it's how I'm consuming data regularly on TikTok and on Instagram on Facebook. Immersive search, virtual explorations of spaces, for example, shops and restaurants before visiting. We're seeing some elements of that, not necessarily the uh, immersive search per se, but we're seeing on TikTok what it's like to experience going to a restaurant before we necessarily then undertake a book in ourselves. And then the evolution of language, search engines being able to understand different accents, speak impediments and languages. We've seen it already that you can create a presentation and then that presentation can be translated into a multitude of different languages in a matter of seconds, which is wonderful yet crazy stuff. And I'm delighted that it's the world that we're currently living in at the moment. So. As I say, a very quick whirlwind through where, what I am seeing in the world of search at the moment. But I guess the key thing for me is to say that search really is everywhere. And uh, thank you so much. Brilliant, Tina. I think it's all true about Gen Z, isn't it? I mean, you see that with, uh, you know, my kids, the way they, you know, they just go to TikTok to find stuff out. But I think it's even passing on to us now. I was just looking earlier for um, some information for a, for, a, for a colleague's study and immediately just sort of gravitate towards TikTok. Um, but um, just to give a mention as well to um, Status Update, which obviously is the, the podcast which um, disrupt them within the Tomorrow Group. And there was a great episode um, where they interviewed uh, Jay Richards about understanding Jay-Z, you know, uh, understanding Gen Z through qualitative data and so forth. So we're at a really exciting moment, aren't we, of, um, of you know, new markets, understanding changing behaviours. And, and as Mon Montserrat says as well, that circle of users being more savvy and the technology responding. So, um Absolutely fascinating insights there. And that obviously, um, as a co-organiser, uh, I can breathe a little sigh of relief there that all our speakers were amazing, um, stuck to time and all the technology worked. So um, we can um, now sort of move on to the final section, Alexi, which is um, going to be um, questions and answers, isn't it? So I think we, what we'd like to do is um, try and ask uh, all these um, uh, brilliant um, people from industry and students that have joined us, if you want to ask one of our panellists uh, a question, um, do try and use the chat. Um, I think it will be easier to sort of manage that. 
So uh, obviously, whilst we're waiting for the questions to come, I guess the question for all of the uh, uh, speakers in some ways. So what would be your key priority if you were to recommend to somebody? Uh, what what uh, should somebody who is starting off with marketing or so for, for a student, I guess, uh, to try and learn, should they be giving up on the profession of marketing because it's all going to be AI driven? Or is there any hope for your recruits uh, to be in your firm, in your company or in your uh, organization, I guess, uh, as an academic as well? I don't know who wouldn't, wouldn't mind. So, what's is, what's the future for your employment in your team, Tina? I don't know if you want to pick up on that. There's so much potential. Oh my gosh! And it, it's really interesting that there is a real fear that AI is going to take over the world. It's going to steal all of our jobs. And we have to remember that AI is only as good as the input that we've put into it. So, it always needs to continually evolve, and that's going to evolve through our own brain capacity and our own learnings and our own research that we can then plug into AI. Um, we've got to be very mindful that AI is going to help us and is already helping us considerably as a business. It means that we can streamline a lot of the processes that are pretty boring for a lot of people that they don't really want to engage in. You know, keyword research, I'm sure Simon will be aware of this. Over the years, the keyword research that you needed to do could take hours once upon a time through AI. You can manage all of this within seconds. So from that perspective, yes, it means we, we've done months and months of us like oh, some of some of us uh, we're, we're doing okay with it but what we're then able to do is really apply much broader thinking critical thinking on what we can be doing for our clients and how we can really develop um their businesses and how we can take them forward so instead of being stuck in the now we're always looking at the future and that makes it really exciting as long as you're um as long as you're building a strong workforce as long as you're helping them learn and engage with them and as long as you're driving forward and delivering great success for your clients and for the business and thank you tina uh, i know would like to go next monty or simon <laughs> monty yeah. had the biggest facial expression <laughs> I'm, oh, sorry. I, 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 I'll take it. I'll be, I'll be brief. Uh, so I, I, I continue on what, what, what Tina says in that, um, yeah, the AI output is just as good as the input. I heard somebody uh, quote, they say, uh, people are afraid that uh, AI is coming for um, marketing agencies' jobs, but uh, AI requires clients to be able to communicate what they want clearly. So our jobs are pretty safe. And I think that's just <laughs> that's a, a funny way of looking at it, but I think absolutely true. Uh, the way I usually tell uh, other business owners, I say, what if you have an employee who was wrong about everything 20% of the time? And when you challenge them on that 20%, not only were, uh, did they not back down, they doubled down repeatedly again and again on that uh, falsehood or inaccuracy. How long would they last in your organization? I say, you know, it's if something's not not uh, reliable, it's just not 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 worth it at all. If I have to fact check uh, my employees or or AI, it, it's just just not useful. So uh, I think absolutely, we this this technology is moving fast. We need to be aware of it and stay up on it. But uh, in terms of people uh, making career changes based on this, I don't think any other industry is any more or less safe. Uh, and certainly, I think you can just ignore this in terms of your career path. Thank you, Simon. Uh, Monty? Yeah, very much agreeing on that. Actually, I think artificial intelligence tools is just a tool. It's just a helper, something that helps you out with automating things, with research, et cetera, et cetera, with a variety of things. Fundamentals are still there. You need to know marketing. You definitely need to know what you are doing because an AI, an AI tool is not going to answer the question for you. It's, it's not an oracle, as I said before. It's, it's more like a... Um, you know, something that is going to help you, giving you um, uh, maybe just just leads for you to, to for you to follow through. So for certain things such as your research or anything else in, in marketing or SEO, um, yeah, it can help you out within certain minutes. But then later on, you definitely need to have an overview on that because um, the what happens with um, particularly generative AI tools is that they help you predict the next word in a sentence or the, the, the next likely word in a sentence or the next likely pixel in a picture. It's not like it's going to give you a true answer 100% of the time. So definitely you need to overview all of that. Um, uh, in the future is for... 
the future is for those people who actually know how to use AI tools and its applications, or maybe can invent uh, new ways of using them uh, rather than uh, rather than just uh, I don't know if there are there are there's going to be any new jobs. Just to answer the question I'm seeing here. There might be, I haven't really thought about that, but for the time being, what we need to learn is how to use them. And also their limitations, because Copilot and ChatGPT do not throw the same results whatsoever, uh, for example. And this is just a very small example of how, uh, how things work. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, Monty. If we go back into the uh, uh, to the academic world, to the academic Well, unfortunately, I don't have an academic perspective. <laughs> well, yeah, let's go. I have, a, I, have, I have a commercial perspective. <laughs> so I think the biggest danger from AI is, is managers not understanding AI. Hmm. Uh, I think what we're seeing right now is a lot of still that enthusiasm. I think Monzi was the one who put up the, uh, the Gartner curve there. I think there's a lot of people who, first off, one of the things about AI is, AI is not one thing, it's many things. I think what a lot of the discussion we've been having is about language learning models. Mm -hmm. uh, for a long time, uh, natural language processing and big data analytics were AI, that kind of shifted with the, the, the GPT mm -hmm. algorithm. Uh, but one of the dangers I think really is, and I think where this started was, is it gonna replace marketers? And I think mm -hmm. th that question was really answered very well. One of the discussions that I've been hearing among managers very recently is that they wanna replace consumers. Uh, with language learning models. So uh, I know that there are several academics working on it, and I know the people at a lot of big uh, companies that you would recognize, Fortune 50 companies, are already experimenting with having the language learning models learn from massive amounts of data mm. online, social media data like Reddit, and then have a simulated consumer and having this simulated consumer answer uh, insight-related questions rather than collecting data from actual humans. So I think, uh, you know, uh, there's a there's a real challenge there for marketing and marketers if we start to replace real customers with simulated customers. And I think this is very problematic, but it's symptomatic of the fact that I think there's a lot of enthusiasm about replacing uh, people mm. with these as Monsi pointed out very clearly, these word guessing models, right? These are, this, mm. this is not about any form of intelligence. That's a form of marketing, mm. calling it into artificial intelligence. It's not an, an intelligence form as the way another sentient being is. This is a word guessing model, right? Mm. It's a piece of software that guesses probabilistically what the next word in a sequence is going to mm. be based on what it's been trained on. And that's not going to simulate a real mm. customer. It's going to right. simulate something else. Okay, well, thank you very much, Rob. So that's, uh, in, I guess, netnography and keyword research should really be real, right? <laughs> As Simon mentioned. Mm -hmm. okay. Great stuff. Alex, are there any questions in the chat uh, that you want to pick up? There are a lot, and uh, our coordinator Gordon has joined that's us now, right. and he's actively uh, responding to people as well, which is uh, which is <laughs> nice. Um, so let's see. Um, so it might be worth just picking up on... Um, Magda's uh, point here about um, with the emergence of AI, what kind of new job roles would we see it generate? So I don't know who's who's would like to pick that one up for us. I don't mind jumping in on that. I think there's a there's a variety. I mean, we're, we're continually seeing jobs evolve all of the time. But even just looking in the, the academic world, research is going to be more integral than anything else. And whether you want to put AI in front of that AI researcher, it's absolutely going to be required for us to progress forward. Um, machine learning capabilities, train, you know, trainers, trainers of AI, we've just, I think I've seen in the chat there that, and one thing that was just mentioned, that if businesses don't understand AI, if leaders, if managers don't understand it, we're going to have a real problem because they're going to have an action undertaken through a directive of board of we must we must put AI and we must do AI stuff and the business have no real understanding what that is. So we need to have the trainers, the researchers, the engineers, the supporters of it within the business. And then also AI ethics. It's going to be a really key aspect as well. So anybody who's studying in the legal world, then, oh, wow, you're going to have a bit of fun, I would say, over, over the next few years about how we're going to <laughs> unpick what is right and what is wrong with AI. Fantastic. Thanks, Tina. Quite a few questions coming in now, so it might be as well to move on to the next one, which is how do small um, businesses with limited budgets navigate this explosion in search 
and where can they get the max impact and the best return on investment? Anyone want to take that one for us? Can we volunteer Simon for that? Yeah, go for it, Simon. <laughs> sure. That's okay. Because you have yeah, a great tool, to. perhaps uh, with a trial period, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Uh, we do indeed. And although I would love to say um, that, uh, yeah, just uh, after driving metrics, all your problems will magically go away. That's, uh, of course, not, uh, not factual. So I, I would say for, for small businesses, it's, it's similar to just SEO in general. You know that it um, it really depends on on the business, who your customers are, and and what you're doing, and what your strengths and what your weaknesses are. Um, because even for a lot of small businesses, I, I counsel uh, customers all the time. I say, you know what, for what you're doing, and given the competitive landscape, SEO is not the right channel for you. And it's it, it, it's it's different for 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 every organization in some. Uh, you know, some small businesses might uh, do better on social, or might be do better on paid search than than just one. And I think for for how can they you know leverage AI too? I think it's going to depend on their specific situation as well. And so if they don't have that kind of expertise in house and don't have time for it, then the idea would be to choose a good kind of local agency or moderately priced agency that can help not just throw you know we've got these solutions and we're going to ram it down your throat. You actually understand what they need and see what how can we actually help you you know for some it might be you know a um you know ai chatbot on the website that kind of automate support for others it might be something completely different and i think it needs to be a custom solution there's never going to be a one size fits all thanks a lot simon a great answer i think um Just, in, in any time of disruption there's always opportunities isn't there for, for smaller companies and to move on things and, and and think about first mover advantage as well i think which is which is great um, Gohar has asked a great question about uh, whether I'm AI will replace sorry. influencers. Sorry. Go on, Robert. <laughs> well, I was just going to say before you do, I thought, Simon, you also answered the question, I think, very well of where the jobs are in AI, because I think that that your answer, you know, at, at the small business level, at the micro business level, at the macro, at the MISA, at every level, there are going to be adjustments in every area from human resources to finance to marketing, where these micro, th basically this ecosystem is going to evolve just as it has uh, and continues to do so for the influencer and, and creator uh, ecosystem. We're just seeing th this burgeoning new ecosystem evolve of all these little micro players of job titles, of new characteristics, of, of new aptitudes. And all of that stuff is gonna combine. That's where your opportunities are. It's not like one thing or 10 things. It's gonna be hundreds or thousands of different sorts of tasks that have to get built in and where we have specialization and pro professionalization around all of them. Okay, sorry, Alex, over to you, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, thanks, Rob. So I should open up to see uh, anyone else wanted to contribute to that one. But um, the question around um, from Gohar was, um, will AI replace influencers? Now, Gordon's put a quite interesting response there, but um, I wonder if any of our panel uh, want to comment on that one. I'm happy to comment on that. Um... There are virtual influencers out there and we've just seen it recently. Snoop Dogg has just created that great um, um, virtual or it's a kind of virtual advert it's really cool and i'm a big fan of, of snoop dogg and i think kylie jenner also um had her own ai created as well and then you've got i think is it lil michaela who is the one who's quite substantial globally but i think the one thing we do need to bear in mind is that something i alluded to before in my presentation is that we're still looking for connection we're looking for validation we're looking for authenticity which is a really huge thing and we're also looking for cultural connection as well and a lot of that you're not going to necessarily get through ai um yes ai is going to work do i think it's going to take over individual human influence um i don't believe so it'll have some impact but i don't think it's going to take over and likewise there's a similar uh, point from miho there about ai kind of taking the jobs of writers actors models but equally you know uh, website designers or you know seo copywriters etc um at Montsi, maybe we could we could bring you on that one do you think um how do you think that will affect um jobs more broadly um, my take on it is that we need to learn, like I said before, all limitations and constraints of every single model and every single uh, um, application of artificial intelligence that there is in there. Uh, because if we don't, then we will be out of work, basically. That's what it is. 
I don't think it's going to replace. I very much agree with Tina. It's not going to replace the, the, human, the human quirks and everything. Uh, because we still need a few things, a few bits and pieces that we can add as humans. And AI is just, like I said, a tool. A tool is not always going to be possible uh, for us to create influencers, etc., etc. Uh, those influencers, virtual influencers, have been created by big companies with big budgets. Not everyone, not every single business is going to be able to, to do that. So um, I, I, just, I just don't think it's going to... Um, it's going to create um, um, a, a problem for people looking looking for work. Um, something that I pointed out in my presentation is that um, this negative feeling about artificial intelligence as a whole and um, and um, and artificial intelligence um, tools. And it's one of the reasons for that is because we keep reading about all of these almost clickbaity headlines. Out, us losing our jobs, um, different companies firing people. We don't really know, people. We don't really know whether that is true or not. What is happening? What was happening a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, is that people started or companies started to hire and over hire, and suddenly they, they decided, and this is the feeling in many um, in many circles. We decided that perhaps those people were not needed anymore. They had overhired, so they needed to get rid of them. It's not because they were going to be replaced. I don't really think they're going to be replaced. And if anything, writers themselves are using AI to help them adjust their their, their ideas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if also if you look at it, because I have used them myself for that, then when you read the text, there are inconsistencies. There are bits and pieces that not well expressed. Any writer will not, will actually put that up and will never put out that, that kind of text. So it's, it's just a matter of helping you, helping you to 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 do this. Uh, so this is the future, I think, or at least the immediate future. Having got a crystal ball, we need to embrace things. That's that's my advice. Embrace things. Embrace everything, and learn about this because this is useful, but also. Don't forget about marketing, because marketing is here. Marketing is not going anywhere. And the fundamentals are not changing. What is changing is something else, maybe the way we apply, uh, we, we, we apply all these things, the way that maybe we can create all these wonderful Snoop Dogg um, virtual adverts, etc., etc. All that kind of thing is, change, is changing. Is changing all the time? Do, do we actually do that all the time? Do we actually create all those things all the time? No. Because it's not going to suit our purposes. It's as simple as that. And we don't have resources. And this is one piece of one on one. Lovely. Thank you, Monty. Um, Anna, you've got your hand up. Yes, uh, I just wanted to mention something very important. And it's uh, all these developments of technology are really raising questions. And they are raising uh, and sometimes challenges that perhaps we haven't considered or we are not ready to tackle. I wanted to. Um, Use the example of BMW that very recently launched a campaign in Greece and they were using um, a virtual influencer. I was watching the TV with my daughter who is 13 years old. I have a trend, oh, I, I could recognize it was an AI. My daughter who is 13, she didn't even pick on that. So we talked about the fact that this person was actually not real. She had no idea this person was not real. And um, uh, in the chapter, when we talk about influencer marketing and, so on the, and the origins and the rise of the AI influencer is that some of, some of these uh, virtual influencers at the beginning were not disclosed as being virtual influencers. And it raises the issue of ethics, which is a very important underpinning point in the, in the book, but also the ethics. And when we talk about genera generation set and so on, what about the alpha generation? The gener and we talk about the importance of critical thinking when we're thinking about young kids and really young kids that don't have or have not developed that critical thinking, what is the ethics and what is the responsibility there? So the fact that the technology is opening all these opportunities is really forcing marketeers to really think really hard and critically and ethically on what are the implications of what we are doing and what sort of world and what sort of uh, future and present we are creating. And that's a very important point. What are the ethics? What are the implications? What about vulnerable uh, population as well, which is a very important point. Thanks a lot, Anna. Uh, my daughter and I, we share kind of videos 
you know, funny or cute videos on Instagram. And um, I shared one yesterday. It was like a baby unicorn, an AI generated baby unicorn. And I think it just terrified her to death. So, um, you know, some of these things are like, um, they're not quite real, are they? And, and that's a bit scary sometimes. Um, Carl, you've got your hand up. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, it was to do with AI and smaller businesses. I was thinking that uh, small businesses can use AI to create visual content quick, quickly and cheaply. A lot cheaper than, say, um, clip arts, uh, what do you call them, um, Shutterstock and the, the ilk. Because, I mean, to be brutally honest with you, I find a lot of that uh, stock photography very corny. Yeah. And if um, if small businesses can produce better, quicker, they're, they're the ones who need to be worried. People like uh, Getty Images and that. Uh, yeah, yeah, so you use AI to create visual content to complement the written content on the website. Definitely, Carl. Yeah, I totally agree. I think there's opportunities there within all these uh, disruptions, isn't there? So thanks for that as a, a small business owner. Um, so I think we've got a question there from Oana as well. Um, people uh, most probably will become overwhelmed with endless online content. Do you see a future where consumers return to more basic, authentic, real interactions? And how can marketers balance this shift with the AI-driven platforms, ensuring trust and authenticity in their strategies? Rob, maybe I could come to you on that one, um, talking about um, the human side of, of, of these things. Yeah, I, I love the question. I mean, we assume from a Western perspective that everything is linear and progress is, you know, always moving in this one direction. But it, I, I think things are cyclical if we look at them. And mm -hmm. there, there, there are movements, and then there are, and then there are reactions to movements, and then there are reactions to the reactions to the movements. I, you know, I mean, <clears throat> I'd actually, I, I think people are hungering for simplicity now in their lives, but it's different people in different places and at different positions in life. I think we will see reactions, uh, uh, you know, ag against uh, some, some of these uh, technological, I think we're already seeing a lot of that. We're seeing voluntary simplicity movements. We're seeing degrowth is, is picking up. Uh, there's just a lot of these uh, kinds of movements. And in fact, I gave a, a fellow speech at, uh, at our recent conference uh, last week in Paris, where I, I basically said that we need to rethink the whole idea of consuming, uh, uh, consuming as waste and consuming as as using things up and expending and spending. And one thing we haven't talked about here, although we've talked about AI a lot, is just how much energy uh, this yeah. is using and how it's powering our need for more and more power plants to burn more and more things or 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 uh, create more and more fuel rods that we can't dispose of safely. So I think we have to question the whole system itself of that's 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 leading to this. It feels a lot. You know, for me, I think for for many other people, perhaps like we're on a treadmill and we can't get off. And so, you know, we're coping. We're embracing, as a few of you said. You know, like I think Tina mentioned, embracing this, right? And 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 we are embracing it. I think, and we're looking at. It. But we also, I think, we have to also bring those critical skills, but that we're using towards thinking about using AI towards you know having a society where AI is is so uh, permeating and the, and the technology companies uh, know so much about us and control so much of, of what our daily lives and our work lives are like. Uh, so I think there are a lot of big questions that, that uh, this conversation raises that are not new, but that are becoming amplified every year as people feel more and more distanced perhaps from, from the world that they knew and from each other. It's a great point, Robin. It's a good point about sustainability. I mean, obviously Anna mentioned we, we've tried, really tried to incorporate more of that thinking into the third edition of the digital yeah. marketing book and we'll do the same with the digital transformation book next year as well because it is such a big issue for everybody isn't it you know yeah. consumers and uh and everybody else um yeah, give alexi you, how i give do, you guys a lot of credit for the time sorry Rob. Yeah. i said i give you guys a lot of credit for that i think you managed to walk you know uh dance a little bit on the head of a pin there uh but it's 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 a difficult thing it's a difficult thing to manage but i think you guys do a very nice job in the book and i certainly noted it that you did try and bring in these articles and the in in these arguments and these counter arguments around you know the increasing digitization of life and what the the, the larger implications and the pictures of that is for sustainability in the planet so kudos to you guys for doing that 
Uh, yeah, so what would you think is uh, the key features of the book? Why should somebody perhaps consider it? Uh, and uh, if you were to <laughs> summarize it in three words, uh, in famous Alex uh, fashion, so what would you say to... I, I, I think it's the conversation that we've just heard in the Q&A is a reflection of how dynamic these space is. And, you know, the things are really moving rapidly. And one of the things that has been a challenge is a challenge for any book editor in this area and, and probably in lots of fields of kind of practical endeavour. It's, it's, it's shifting so quickly that six months, 12 months down the track, you know, things are going to look pretty different. It was a comment I've just put in. I can't remember in reply to what now, but it's the fact that some of the principles that probably we all learnt very early on as in you know academic careers or in very early on in industry you know it's not necessarily knowing how to specifically solve the problem of today it's having the toolkit to understand the general approach you know there's a really strong argument for going back to some of the sort of philosophical underpinnings some of the critical thinking systems thinking that underpins a lot of this discussion um because ultimately those are the toolkit that that enables us to kind of be resilient to what's coming that we don't know what it looks like exactly we can guess but we don't know exactly what it's going to look like and i think in a way a lot of the book does really try to pick up on that and and be very careful in being too focused on the now and really looking at you know the skill set the knowledge base the understanding the interpretation the perspectives that will still serve everyone in this room well you know in multiple years time and that's a real risk you know i i use an example we have it when um uh we we're designing a new program uh you know it might be a new course doesn't matter what the subject area is and one of the first things we do um and lots of institutions do it we go and say let's talk to some employers and there's employers in the room the risk is that the employers come into the room and what they give is a wish list of of the uh the characteristics of the employee that they'd like to see in their office tomorrow morning at 9 a.m that's not what we're educating people for it's actually you know someone in five years with the skill set to be able to be still employed in that organization in 10 years and that's not necessarily the message that an employer wants to hear because they're they're struggling to fill uh, roles right now today tomorrow um, education can be a quick fix but it also needs to be a long-term fix for some of these issues and i think that's one of the challenges hence the need for a textbook of any description Nice. It's a great, great, great survey, Gordon. Thank you. Nice. So there you go. So it's a uh, long fix uh, for your challenges if you are looking for solutions. Mm. <laughs> great stuff. Uh, anyway. Alex, uh, there is the one last uh, opportunity. Uh, obviously, the publishers have been very kind uh, with us and they have also shared with us a discount code. This is uh, available from October till March next year. And this is uh, EFLY04. And you can use it uh, only on publisher's website. So it's on roadledge.com. And uh, this is where the code will hopefully be available until the 31st of uh, uh, well March next year.